first speaker is Matthew Sturricker. Matthew is the Manufacturing Manager at Edmund Optics. Matthew earned a BS degree in physics from Allegheny College. He has over 15 years experience in manufacturing, ranging from metal manufacturing, precision glass molding, diamond turning, and conventional and CNC optical fabrication. In Matthew's current role as Manufacturing Manager at Edmund Optics, his management responsibilities include overseeing the machine shop, diamond turning cell and fabrication cell, on-time delivery, yield, process optimization, quotes and budgets, and on-the-job training and continuing education and workforce development. So it is my pleasure at this time to turn it over to Matthew. Are you here, Matthew? Hello. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Um, I, I hope I'm, I'm close to as smooth as the previous speakers. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as Sandra said, I'm the Manufacturing Manager at Edmund Optics. We're located in Barrington, New Jersey, and, and just to give everybody a little bit of background, we've been in uh, New Jersey since 1942. We were started by uh, Norman Edmund, and he started it in his uh, apartment in Collingswood, New Jersey in 1942. Um, so, what we, we got our start refurbishing optics during World War II. And <clears throat> And from that spawned our manufacturing facility. We were primarily like catalog company up until about 2000 when we started to increase our manufacturing capabilities. And over the past 20 years, we have grown from 300 employees to over a thousand employees globally. Um, and we had a small footprint in New Jersey where we did manufacturing. And that has grown to manufacturing sites in uh, Singapore, Japan, China, Tucson, as well as Barrington, New Jersey. Uh, we went from a, uh, a very small, maybe uh, 1,000 square foot optic shop in New Jersey to now I believe we're on the order of about five to 6,000 square feet of manufacturing space. <clears throat> and in that manufacturing space, we, uh, bring in raw material, grind and polish glass, manufacture uh, metal to hold housing, uh, hold the lenses and housings, and um, as well as do optical coatings and assembly, QA and out to the customer. And the we specialize in, in really components and the assemblies. And those can range from imaging lenses that are scanning product that is being shipped out the door from the US Postal Service, Amazon, UPS, to night vision goggles to the military. Um, <clears throat> so all of that is housed in our factory in New Jersey. Um, so when the pandemic hit, uh, we, as with most companies, our, our facility was, was broken up into essential and non-essential workers. Um, essential workers, basically meaning hands-on, we need them to operate equipment, ship product out the door. Uh, Non-essential, primarily uh, staff that's, that's doing engineering work, um, sales was uh, set up at their home offices to continue to take order, technical support. And then we had managing uh, management staff, which was rotating throughout the facility. And all of it was built around minimizing any exposure that uh, any of the staff uh, would have. So um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of weeks into it, we actually split our workforce into two shifts. And during that time period, what we uh, had was we had to make sure we had a balanced skill set between the two shifts. So for the essential workers, they were, um, uh, they were paid for four weeks out of the month, but were actually in the facility only two weeks out of the month. And that was, the, in the case that there were an outbreak on one of the shifts, we would actually be able to continue operations. So we're trying to mitigate the, the risk to the company as well as to the workforce, which we had. They, we supplied them with full PPE during their uh, working, uh, working days and instituted various guidelines to uh, enhance social distancing and, and safeguard the employees as well as the company. Um, <clears throat> we were lucky to be able to continue to service our customers, um, as well as many of our customers, which are manufacturing product, which is used in the testing of COVID-19. Um, so uh, I think what we found during the, the pandemic is, and uh, I'm hoping with the, this program that, uh, that we're putting together, 
it will um, uh, remove remove the idea that you need a four year college degree to actually compete and have a living wage in this world. Um, many of the individuals that were keeping the economy and, and keeping the US going were hands on people. They had to get their hands dirty. And um, manufacturing was on a downturn as we saw, but uh, I, I firmly believe that because of the pandemic, it's actually gonna rise rise back and it's, you're gonna see a resurgence of US manufacturing simply because with, without manufacturing, we wouldn't have been able to get through this. Many of the essential businesses were, were hands-on individuals, which were actually keeping us, uh, keeping us going. <clears throat> so the, the influence of the pandemic, it, it, in, it required us to become extremely efficient with communications. Um, having, having interactions on a daily basis were taken for granted. So you could walk to a manufacturing shop, sketch something out on a piece of paper and have, uh, have an explanation face to face. Well, that, that was uh, very difficult due to this and having split, a, uh, managing two different shifts and one shift, which I actually was not allowed to interact with face to face. Um, it, it was a learning curve for myself, but uh, as well as I, I have some individuals who are not as savvy with technology, but they, they came up to speed. I have a, uh, a machinist who claims he's not a computer guy yet he programs CNCs all day and he was able to adapt very well and, and helped talk through junior employees through the phone uh, uh, constantly, even, even at off hours, he, he wanted to jump in and make sure that, he made, uh, that our operations were continuing to run. <clears throat> so it, it forced a lot of employees, I think, to, to grow up as well. Um, and, and I don't mean that in, in a derogatory term, but um, when you're hands-on, uh, you have, uh, you're able to show people things, you're allowed to, to coach and teach a lot more. When you're remote, you're forced to become self-reliant a lot faster in order to ensure that you're still getting the job done as well as uh, the, the uh, other tasks that you have and, and learn things on a much quicker basis. Um, during, during this time, uh, Joe uh, Pranzatelli introduced me to John Taggart because we started talking and he asked how things were going. And um, uh, I spoke to him about matter hackers. And this was in the, in the midst of uh, New Jersey having a very difficult time, end of March, beginning of April. And uh, we have a, a couple of 3D printers at our facility. And um, matter hackers is a 3D printing addict printing additive manufacturing company. And they uh, reached out to their community and cast a, a broad net and said, hey, who has manufacturing capabilities? Who has the ability to help us out? Let us know what you have. And we're going to send you over some information. Let's see if you can help us out. And it was all on a voluntary basis. And what they ended up doing was sending out some basic solid files for individuals to uh, factories to print, individuals to print on their 3D printers, package up and ship to their facility and they distribute it. And it was basic things such as mask bands, headbands that were very, uh, very simple to manufacture, uh, low, uh, low oversight with 3D printing. And we're able to help with some of the shortcomings of the PPE during the pandemic. Um, and having that conversation, um, John and Joe, and I were talking about how do we create a same, that same sort of network in, in New Jersey. Um, uh, unfortunately, things didn't take off, but it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that it can't. And it's understanding that um, maybe supply chain isn't as much of a shortage as it seems. We're just uh, painted into a corner of what we believe the supply chain needs to be. So getting manufacturers more integrated into supply chains because manufacturers know what they can make. Supply chains don't necessarily understand where, where the ins, of, ins and outs of manufacturing can be. We may not be optimized to injection mold something that was sourced out of China for a nasal swab, but many of us have CNC lays that can turn out plastic vials just as fast 
just uh, it, it won't be as cost effective. But when you're in a pandemic, you, you have to pull out all the stops to be able to help everybody out. <clears throat> so the uh, where we uh, where we sit right now is um, the, the the future of uh, of manufacturing. I think it's it, especially during the pandemic. Um, and where we go forward is going to be, uh, I, I think, very focused on understanding if we have the correct skill sets in the factory and also kind of diversifying the, or not diversifying, but um, replicating the number of skill sets that we have. Um, because as we split up our shifts, we realized that we had shortcomings all across and single points of failure. Um, and uh, anybody else that is uh, a manufacturer in this call understands how difficult it is to get skilled labor in-house, which th this type of program is critical to, to building that workforce. Um, we, will, we will sometimes interview half a dozen employees, and it could take three to six months to hire somebody in-house that actually has the skill set that we need, and we don't have to worry about completely retraining them and um, uh, bringing them from the ground up. Um, I'll use uh, my my brother as an example. That he, it's a it's a viable career path. He he wasn't he wasn't the best individual at school. College wasn't his his thing. So he worked on a manufacturing floor, running a uh, running a couple of pieces of equipment that they trained him on, and, and didn't go much beyond that. Didn't have any trade experience. Um, then he moved on to becoming a mason, uh, well a laborer for a mason. Um, kind of, uh, I, I hate to say it, but floundered a little bit for about four or five years. And he peaked out at about $16, $17 an hour. Uh, and then an opportunity popped up to, to go to a, um, a vocational school for six months to learn how to do um, manual and CNC machining. And it was a full-time program, five days a week at a community college in Pennsylvania. And after that, they have 100% placement. He found a job at a machine shop. Um, and lo and behold, his starting salary was the same that he spent about five years getting to uh, working as a laborer. And, and that's just six months of, uh, of skilled training, hands-on training, book training as well. Um, but having a starting salary that he, he didn't even think he was going to get to after a number of years. And then obviously um, having a stable job. Um, a lot of people were worried about that when the pandemic hit is what am I going to do for work now? Well, as I stated earlier, many of the essential workers and critical jobs, which had to remain open in order to continue the fight, and to continue the economy rolling, we're hands-on manufacturing jobs. And it, it, it goes to show that it, it may not be the uh, most polished job in the world, and that is not an, uh, an optics pun, but um, it, it keeps everything moving and, and keeps everybody uh, in, uh, it, it keeps the economy going. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think that's about it.